So the first reading is uh, in uh, Ezekiel 37, verse 1 to 14. The Valley of Dry Bones. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and sent me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and the tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into this slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will leave and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Yes. The second reading is from Book of Acts, chapter 2. It's a story of Pentecost. The first Pentecost is from verse 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under the heaven, living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Siren, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. 
But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents and the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, today's last Bible scripture <coughs> from Gospel John chapter 15, verse from 18 to 27. If the world hates you, just remember that it hates, hates me first. If you belong to the world, then the world would love you as it won. But I choose you from this world, and you do not belong to it. This is why the world hates you. Remember that what I told you, slaves are not greater than their master. If people persecute me, they will persecute you too. If they obeyed me by teaching, they will obey yours too. But they will do all this to you because you, you are mine. For they do not know the one who sent me. They would not have been guilty of sin if that had not come and spoken to them. As it is, they no longer have any excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. They would not have been guilty of sin if I had not done among them the things that not else ever did. And it is, they have seen what I did, and they hate both me and my father. This, however, was bound to happen so that what is written in the there's law may come true. They hate me for no reason at all. The helper will come, the spirit who revealed the truth about God and who come from the Father. I send him to you from the Father. He will speak about me, and you too will speak about me because you have been with me from the very beginning. We are today on the day of Pentecost. We are also in the third week of Christ Well, in the final first segment of Christ Well um, effort of us as a community. I'm not going to call it a campaign. And if you remember well, or if you haven't heard it or seen it, or you were not here the last two weeks, I'm going to make it much easier. We, we said that at the center of our wholeness, not holiness, wholeness, completeness, is a range of parts of our life that are made well through Christ, with Christ, for Christ. And then, without obviously anybody's objection because I was presenting, we have put spiritual wellness. We, we took the reading from third epistle of John where it says that we are already well, our soul is already well. And therefore, we have put that as a reason to be at the center, but that's not the full reason at all. And around it, we put different aspects of our lives. We put things we do, you know, um, and we also put things that are true with our health and who, and everything we mentioned, the social well-being, we mentioned physical, we mentioned financial, professional, career, mental, emotional, and in it all the relationships that come with it. 
<clears throat> and of course, when I say, look, at the center of it and the base of it is what John is saying. John is an old man when he's writing this. He was there the next step after what you heard today of, of the day of Pentecost when him and Peter went into the temple and healed uh, a paralyzed man and a, a cripple at the entrance. Cripple is called in the Bible. At the entrance of the temple. So, so he was there from very young age and now probably found it as mesmerizing and confusing to what Jesus was trying to tell him to do to the point of being completely stunned by the fact that, that the Holy Spirit actually was poured on all the people. And at, at, at a, his late age, he now extracted what he realized or what he concluded is the essence of this witnessing. And it is not by mistake that we put it there because this is Christian church, so we say like we put Christ first. But it is the fact that Christianity as was communicated to us by Christ is actually real, real living of the relationship with God. It is not that it has been tried, and I'm quoting here, famous British apologetics, it is not that it has been tried and found wanting, which, which tells us that if you have found that Christianity as a worldview might help you feel belonging to a tribe or to a group or to your family, but in reality doesn't do much for you for the rest of your life, for the for other aspects of your life, of our life, doesn't seem to bring permanent peace, doesn't seem to bring that joy that Jesus is referring to in chapter 4, 15 and 17 of John, which you have taken last week, where, where he's talking about us, but he's inserting there, they're saying that, that he's talking to his father and he's saying, I want to leave my joy with them. I want to make that a center of their life, that joy. So if you are not finding that, there must be something off. And in the first week of this, we said, okay, we're gonna consider three things, three things. If there are thousands of different ways, what, what are these three things that would create this? There are three things that we find that we have discussed in the last few weeks and today is the third one. The first one is, who is Christ? Who is Christ? We discovered that the first week. And for those of you who were not there two weeks ago, I have to tell you we were battling with this issue of how easy it is to miss the shades of, of calling Christ um, Son of God, but in reality perceiving him in our lives as just a good moral teacher or a healer or a miracle maker. And you can see this by the extent of the relationship. You can see this because you can see that the relationship is sort of a supplementary relationship. You know, he is like a supplement. You know, like you eat every day, but people who want to make more money, um, they tell you you need to take supplements just in case you've eaten wrong today. So you take food supplements, you take vitamin C. So, so the outcome of that Jesus is Jesus as a food supplement for our life. That, that's the Jesus that we get. And then we thought, okay, so, so ultimately nothing really to do with me. And then we said there's a possibility that some of us, without noticing, cannot battle, cannot understand his humanity. We find it too offensive. We, we, we just can't absorb it. So he's very, very holy. And of course, only holy, not man, just God, which raises all kinds of questions to do with the resurrection, but more importantly, when it comes to the relationship with us, it creates, again, that God of Greek mythology, Zeus or, or Baal, who is riding on clouds, because that's what Baal does. And in Elijah's case, he failed to show up. But we create that God who is untouchable, who is distant, and 
who we know is giving us something, we, we know that, because he's saying, I died for your sins, to, for you can be saved, and I give you love. But we are so focused on that, that he is God, that we simply can't find any other reason or to do anything else with his love but then to send it back. And we enjoy that faithfulness, that faith. That faith that is based on the fact that I send back to God what God has given to me. And this is my obedience. And then we said we have a third option that at times, maybe when we are not trying to rationalize, uh, just to say, of course, again, this ends up with us. Because how many times you can send the same thing up and down, and in the end it ends up again alone. We end up alone, not because God wants us to be alone, alone but because somehow it is not comfortable to engage with the humanity that he has poured out the Holy Spirit on everyone. So, and then we are in that section, we, we sort of very smartly concluded that the true reality is that he's fully man and fully God. And that he's building something here that was never there before. And it's an upside down religion. It's not the religion where people have traditions and actions that are going to lead to me eventually reaching God and living in that perfect place. But rather that God came down, which disqualifies it as a typical description of religion. So it became more the way, as it was called the first three centuries, as it was forming as a new, new movement. And from it, it became obvious that this is about the relationship, that this is about living rather than just obeying. And that obedience comes from a different place than a place of fear, but rather comes from overwhelming love of God. And then in the second week, if you missed it, we asked, okay, so that's Christ. What about us? How do they see us? And we talked about parents who are terrible gossipers. You know, I mentioned that parents always tell you the worst in your face and always the best behind your back. This is a, this is a terrible qualification, very poor gossipers. So, because they always criticize you in the face, but always talk the best about you. You don't even recognize yourself. You could listen to what they say, their girlfriends and boyfriends and, and families and, and brothers and sisters. And we, we read 15 and 17, 15, Jesus is talking to disciples, 17, he's directing his talk to God. And you can see, he talks even better about us when he talks to God than, than when he talks to us. And the conclusion of it, we are bona fide, we, we, are, we are certified, fully included members of God's family. That's what God wants. And the firstborn, our brother, is also our king. And our, also our earthly lord. And also our God. And it is us who are calling each other bastards, not God calling us. We are not the ones disqualified by our heavenly family. It's us who can't find it acceptable that the person next to me is a member of the same family, so I don't want to be a sibling with him. So maybe I, I decide to step out. So, and we discovered that through that, our identity, our box of identity, which is based usually on race, color, gender, ethnicity, and our box of our perspective on life, which is based on whole loads of ideas that were learned over time that make us conservative or liberal or Christian or Muslim or whatever we think we are. And then obviously, the, from perspective to the position, which is the result of our work, of our power over others, all of this put together is really only worth here. It makes any sense here. Anything after that, when the music of life stops, when the last heartbeat stops, when the last breath stops, there is no rhythm section anymore. When that happens, all of these things simply disappear. And Paul got it. Paul got it. Uh, he said, here on earth you need faith and you need hope and love. These are the three greatest things. But one day, when I go to see my maker, faith and hope will not be needed. Faith for what? I can see him. I'm with him. Hope for what? All the hope has been fulfilled. The only thing that remains is love. And therefore, we come to now the third week. 
And the third week, I said from the beginning, was about what is Christ saying we should be doing together? And I maybe slightly misguided you last week when I said that ascension is the end of Christ's bodily ministry, his personal ministry here on earth. At the face of it, when, when he ascended, it is true. But in reality, it is not. Because his ministry continues to his presence through the, poor, through the Holy Spirit, through us. And therefore, we come now to this big revelation, big bang of a third week to say, okay, so now all of this, what is it for? You know, like Japanese have a system in, I think Toyota invented it. When something doesn't work, they say why and why and why and why up to nine times until they get to the core of it. And you could do similar, you know, you could say, so let's do the same to the gospel. So Christ was born, so, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and you just come to your ascension and you can't resist but saying, and then, and then us, witnesses, us, witnesses. And the question that arises today is how much of this is me trying to communicate something that would result in all of us serving more or being a better community? Or how much of it is absolutely essential for every person's survival here? Because if this life here, we see it as a life with Christ, and not as a preparation, it's a separate independent life, but eternity has already begun. It would be logical to think that we are supposed to be doing whatever we can comes out of us as who we are. And therefore, we assume we're not gonna change who we are because we've already been made a new creation by Christ. So when the time comes to switch from this life to next life, we are still who we are then it would be make sense to stay the same person. We can't go to gates of heaven and say, by the way, before I was this, but now I'm here, let me tell you the truth. I wasn't that person, I was just kidding. I'm this new person. And I, I always think God will tell me, you're right, you're kidding, just you're kidding yourself because you haven't been kidding me. Your whole life was about kidding yourself. <clears throat> and you might think that this concept of Christ, in Christ, with Christ, and for Christ, and spirituality in Christ has implication only on our faith and our religious experience, but I beg to differ. Why? Because the witnessing changes it. This is where the, where the core of the matter is. What do we see as witnessing? Because there are many thousands of ways to get this wrong, and only one way to get it right. Only one way to get it right. When we take all of these aspects of your life, I just want you to look at all the aspects. I don't know all the aspects of your life. But you, when you take all of them, and when you surround these aspects of your life, of our lives, of the core, which is our spiritual wellness in Christ, for Christ and with Christ, and then you take that and you collapse it, you remove it. There is no spiritual wellness. You end up with a whole range of aspirations, whole range of activities, whole range of efforts, whole range of keeping busy not to get bored or despaired in this life with us at the center. So it starts from us and builds back to us. Everything we do. And people are saying, well, there is some difference, you know, in motherhood. Yeah, I agree. There is some small difference in motherhood. Up to the point that that love that mother is giving is, is bona fide love mentioned in the Bible, but it's not, any, it's not for the fact that I can feel like a fulfilled woman. So I have experienced motherhood. Because at that moment, it is not any more love. It's a transaction. I give you this, you give me this. Yeah, I wash you today, and you call me mommy. You know, that's it, I'm happy. I'm, I have a purpose in life. But when we remove the spiritual core of it, unfortunately, the emptiness stays. Unfortunately. 
because we are not large enough to fill it up. And look what happened to, to the, in, in, in Ezekiel in, in, in the first reading. We see Ezekiel prophesizing even to the spirit. And God is clearly saying, out of your empty lives, I can make a fully vibrant life. Here, I'm going to send this man who doesn't want to be a prophet. And then who, who, who can see that nothing happens out of his prophecy, prophesying, because the more he's prophesying, the dumber the people are getting that he's prophesying. Or maybe not dumber, but more stubborn. And he's demonstrating, but he's demonstrating something that we end up partially emulating. We even have churches in which we declare prophets. Apparently, that's a sort of pastor on steroids. I don't, I don't know what it is. But the unfortunate thing with it is that prophet is the person who actually repeats what God told him to say. Okay? That's what prophet does in one way or the other. But what you hear in what we read in chapter 15 from Jesus saying, I'm the wine, I'm the branch, I'm the, the tree of this, this grape wine, and you are the branches, it must have looked like cruel to some of the disciples. You know, what are you talking about? They just arrested you. They just crucified you. What kind of wine are you? What is he talking about? And then he motivates them by telling them they're going to hate you even more than me. Or they're going to hate you equal. I mean, talking about getting a job that the guy tells you, listen, you're going to, you're going to suffer. Yeah. So uh, what is the pay? Sorry? <laughs> what a way to recruit the, the followers. <laughs> Depress them straight from the beginning. But says something very unique. You will have no power until to do what I'm asking you to do, to be my witness until you receive the power from above. Until I leave, because however many of you gather on, a, on the mount, however many of you gather around the lake, even if I sit in a boat, I can't reach more than 3,000, 5,000, however many of you can hear me. But when I leave, and the advocate lives in each one of you, I can reach the whole world. So therefore, the only thing that now matters is whether that world will know it is I who is whispering to them and they're not hearing. And therefore, my witnesses are there to witness of my love. Now, that becomes really difficult because we look at prophets and we don't realize that it's not the same job. This is living, this is saying what God tells the prophet to say and do. And this is living with God. We are prophets who prophesy with our life. St. Francis said it, preach gospel at all times, and if necessary, use the words. Completing the love of God in us can only be done if we are the witnesses of his love to the world. And that is really super difficult to understand, to be honest. I mean, am I, am I going to end up really scared because every move I make, well, was this in love of God? Was this not in love of God? So it is understandable that we switch to templates. Psychologists call that templates, life templates. We sometimes copy the life templates from our parents. So we switch to templates. We switch to commandments. We switch to learn, you know, quick little thing, God is great, yeah, or Jesus saves, or whatever it is, small little squips, you know, here and there, and we turn it into templates, and when we try to witness, we try to witness to people with templates, and there's no love in that, because there's no relationship in that. And the worst of all, we witness to ourselves through these templates. If we find it so scary to let go and let God, and <laughs> let God's love work in us, that the moment we wake up in the morning, we have to put something safe. My job, my structure, my daily devotion, my prayer. Something needs to be structured just not to allow him to speak before I have a chance to speak myself. <laughs> Very funny thing to live love. Huh? It's scary. Come on, you know it's scary. You've been in love. You know how scary it was. And this is like 24-7 being in love. It's scary. It's scary and it's challenging 
because we are not in charge. That's the worst thing. And then he says, now we are in charge together. Now, what do you mean in charge together? I'm not used to that. So it is no wonder that we turn then to our faith, which I believe in, mo in all of us, there is Holy Spirit and it's genuine. But we try to block it with, with trying to fill up our life with all the Christian tradition that is beautiful as a reminder, but cannot be the core of our life. It can be the outcome of love of God. <clears throat> Obedience, faithfulness, holiness, acting the, how we should be acting within God's will and commandments is an outcome of God's love in us. Not the way to earn it, not a precondition of this. Have we succeeded? Yeah, I think we have. Can we succeed? Yeah, I think we have. But partially we didn't. Because from 17th, 18th, maybe 19th century, at the time of enlightenment, slowly, slowly, people started rejecting against this template Christianity. That, and then, obviously, Pentecostalism came in to say, well, no, 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 it's live. But people are sort of moving, and more and more, you can see that we are nominal Christians. What is strange is that the result of that is that that spiritual core of our life, our soul, cannot be healed. You can see continuous impact of that on society. Now, I don't know the reason why suicide rates are growing through the roof all over the world. I don't know. But I would think that if a repetitious, repetitious life, even if it's successful, even if it's about recognizing God, but it's repetitious life without life in it. Nothing but our awareness that we are mortal. Nothing else. Fills us with despair. Fills us with despair. Dostoevsky wrote about it by saying, to, to, talked about Sisyphus, the guy who pulls the big stone to the top of the hill just for the stone to roll back and he starts again tomorrow. If your life looks like that, ta -da, that's the one. That's the one. Yeah. I, I have a guy who I don't know very well, but I um, can't even pronounce his name. He's a French writer called Guy, who in 1880s wrote, a, wrote a, a story about suicide. And he, in that story, talked about a guy that major, at that time it was very popular to publish the letters, the leaving letters in the newspapers. It's a true, true tradition. And you will find that most of the time there was no big reason. It was just a cum accumulation of small moments of despair and loneliness until there was no other purpose. Living without living. Our soul dies. The rest of the life looks like a, a theater. Looks like a theater. So the question then remains, so what do we do with this knowledge now? How do we avoid our own lives collapsing on a bare metal floor of our stubbornness. How, how do we avoid that? Well, Christ said it <laughs> very directly and very openly. Wait for the power from heaven to descend on you so that we together can love you and this broken world. Wait for my love to descend on you. Now, he didn't tell us we need to wait for 40 days. Maybe just when we open our eyes. Maybe when we look at different parts of our life and don't rush into a decision. Don't rush into using what is simple. Trying to just extract shortcuts, templates, forms. Removing relationship, removing soul out of it. But maybe just waiting for a few seconds and saying, hey, he promised me power from heavens. Let him teach me how to be that parent. No, actually no. Don't let him teach him because then he will be just a teacher. Let him help me and live through me in loving my children every day and my family every day. Let him work in me and with me when I go to do whatever job that I'm doing at the moment. Let him be with me and in me when I'm praying, when I'm praising, when I'm singing, even when I'm snoring. In Christ, for Christ, 
and with Christ. Next three weeks, there will be no special sermons on, on, on this Christwell campaign. And we are doing it differently this time because now we are taking what we heard and say, okay, let's take a breather. Let's wait from the power from the heaven above. Let's look at our ministries. Let's look at all this beautiful thing that God has created in this community through many of his servants who understood the power of waiting, who, who could hold back even though they knew a shortcut, the management resolution, the, the, the quick one, two, three, four. That's how this amazing community who speaks so many, as many languages as we heard today in, 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 in Act 2, we speak that many languages here. That's how God put us together. So my invitation to us as a community, my personal invitation you heard, but it's the same. Let us now go back to what we had or we think we should have or to what we are because ultimately that will help us together completing love of God in each one of us by serving together. And this is the time to now maybe wait, let the spirit descend from above to each ministry, to each servant here, to each sister and brother our children are already part of it. You can see it today and you can see it every Sunday. Let us pray. God of amazing miracles, we never expected this miracle, that we shall be called sons and daughters of God, that we shall be included, that we shall be paid in advance, that we shall be empowered to live, to walk, to talk, to pray, to love with you. That we shall experience the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And that we shall experience the miracle of patience. For that power of my, our heavenly family to show on our faces and in our lives. Amen.